All right, ladies and gentlemen, if you'll resume your seats, we're going to go ahead and get started with what we'll describe quite accurately as the panel we've all been building up to, both figuratively and literally. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to my, my wonderful colleague, LBJ School professor, Dr. Josh Eisenman. Josh? Uh, great. Thanks, Bobby. It's, it's great to be here. And having heard the word China so many times today, I appreciate you all sticking around to uh, the grand finale here, the China panel. Here we have, um, as you can see from our bios, um, an excellent group um, representing defense, state, CIA, and actually I served on Capitol Hill, so we've got a, a quadfecta, such a thing exists. Um, so, I, you know, we were talking amongst ourselves, and I think we're going to get right into q and I'm going to ask a couple of questions, and then we're going to turn it over to you guys, because I feel like there's just a lot of questions about China in the audience, and especially from students. I want you guys to get your questions going in your head. Um, but I want to turn in kind of to the panel here and ask a, a kind of a place-setting question, if I will. Um, there's been a variety of reports recently uh, about uh, the changing nature of the U.S.-China relationship. Um, the Sharp Power Report, um, uh, one report yesterday from Stanford. Um, there have been people, uh, including my own advisor, Mike Lampton, who 2015 talked about a tipping point in U.S.-China relations. Um, that tipping point is, it appears to be on, uh, upon us. Um, so my question uh, for you uh, as a panel, and we can kind of maybe take it from Chris and, and come down the line, is um, was engagement a mistake? Um, was engagement a failure? Um, if it was, why? If it wasn't, why? And um, you know, were we hoodwinked by Beijing, as many <laughs> seem to suggest we were, um, uh, as the president himself seems to suggest sometimes? Um, so with those provocative questions, I'll turn it over to you. <laughs> Well, thank you, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, I, I literally got off a plane from Beijing last night <laughs> and then turned around and got on another one this morning to come here, um, and that's just a sign of my respect for Will and uh, the opportunity to come and serve with this great panel. Um, I've, uh, I'll admit that I'm a bit of an uh, outlier on this subject because I don't think engagement was a failure, and, uh, and, and that seems to be the common theme. And the reason why, primarily, is um, it strikes me that to suggest the engagement policy was a failure is to suggest that somehow we were indeed hoodwinked, that 50 years of leadership didn't know what they were doing, that the wily Chinese pulled one over on us uh, through a series of clever leaders who said, well, we'll fool them by th letting them think we're going to democratize, but in fact, we're going to, you know, uh, come up with a, a, a plan to dominate the world. No, if you interview Kissinger and you interview Dr. Brzezinski, he's passed away now, but I did before he, he passed away, and you interview the people who were intimately involved, there was never any suggestion that we thought China was going to democratize. It was a purely strategic calculus that we made. So that's one point. I think the second point is the Chinese propagandists actually came up with a very helpful term <laughs> uh, on this in 2009. The term is historical nihilism. There's a lot of historical nihilism being practiced in the US China watching community as we try to shift blame, protect reputation, um, talk about who lost China, and so on. Um, you know, the facts are that uh, the regime is ugly in its nature. Um, it has been very consistent. I find it striking, again, there's another narrative that's out there now about how, well, what happened to Deng Xiaoping? He was a great guy. Now we have Xi Jinping. He's horrible. <laughs> Deng Xiaoping was ruthless, right? He was Mao's willing henchman in the anti-rightist campaign. He single-handedly orchestrated the Tiananmen crackdown. People forget about these things, right? And they think, oh, well, you know, the, it was better then. Now it's terrible. There's actually tremendous consistency, you know, in, in, in the regime. And that's very important for us, I think, to understand. Because I think the, the fundamental issue here is a breakdown in the China watching scholarship in this sort of period in the 90s into the early 2000s where there was this notion that through intraparty democracy and some of the other sort of things that they were um, playing around with, that the system was moving toward this sort of more open, open system. Uh, it's actually, that period was actually the anomaly. If you look over the history of the regime, what we have now is actually much more consistent with what the regime was headed toward. And the nature of the regime means that it can only go so far. It can only work within certain constraints. So I, I drag us through that because I think it's very important because what you get on the other end then is the avoidance of a huge pendulum swing in our approach toward China which then causes us to engage in bad policy rather than a steady, calm assessment that's consistent over time. Yeah. 
Great. Uh, well, I come from a more of a defense perspective, but I actually agree uh, quite a bit with you. I, I actually don't think engagement was a mistake, again, because the purpose of engagement was not about democratizing China. Uh, it was a set of strategic calculations and, frankly, economic calculations as well uh, that we made. And when, when China uh, joined the WTO, and as much as people like to point to that as a bad thing, uh, our exports went from 16 billion to 192 today um, per year. So, I mean, I think people also need to understand uh, that there was economic benefit to engaging uh, China in the international space. Um, I think that Xi Jinping is different. I do think that uh, that under his leadership, China has made a set of decisions uh, relating to its you know national economic enterprise, but also its foreign policy uh, that have shifted significantly from where we were in the last uh, couple of decades when China was much more uh, um, not as focused about engaging in the world as they are now. Um, so I do think it's, I think Xi Jinping is very different. But, you know, the same question has to be asked about, well, what is the purpose of competition as well? So what's the purpose of engagement? What is the purpose of competition? And, you know, I think that there are ways that we can both engage China and leverage China, frankly, to our benefit, um, and also compete with them when we need to compete with them. And I think that that is, uh, Frankly, we're gonna, where we're going to end up uh, as we even go as we go through this phase of competition as a sort of the trendy, uh, the sort of trendy strategy line that everyone's using at conferences. No offense, Will, um, but I, I do think that uh, the more natural state of being uh, going forward is going to be some sort of balance uh, between having to engage the you know second soon to be biggest economic power in the world uh, and just trying to isolate them and contain them and compete with them, which I don't think is necessarily a sustainable course either. So, uh, so I would fall in the camp of engagement was not a mistake and it still isn't a mistake. I think we still need to do that. Um, just with more clear perspective on what the Chinese intentions are. And I think we're starting to get that, which is good. Well, let me amend the question a bit. So if, if engagement wasn't meant to democratize China, and some folks have said it is during the 80s and 90s, et cetera, but if it wasn't, it was certainly meant to bring them on side so we could work with them in a more cooperative way. I think some of the panelists today suggest that that's not happened. So um, if we adjust maybe our intention of engagement, has it been successful in increasing and enhancing U.S.-China cooperation? You know, I, I find, I mean, when I teach... I always ask students the question, what's, what's the alternative, right? I mean, we can say, what was the problem with engagement? What would we have done? We tried this, by the way, from 1949 until 1970. We had a strategy of trying to weaken and defeat China, right, in some form or another, right? How did that turn out? And what would have happened if we had persisted in that, right? How would that have served American interest? So if you just do a purely national interest characterization, what was done beginning with some thoughts during the Johnson administration, then ultimately, was just a recognition that the other strategy wasn't going to work, right? It wasn't producing any benefits for the United States. And to pursue and to persist that it could have produced war, right? We could have, we could have attacked the Chinese nuclear capability in 1964. That was debated at the time. So, you know, there are certain, you can't debate policies in the abstraction for, compared to what else you might do. And that's the same problem we have now, which Kelly said so nicely, is we have to think about what the choices are here and not say, well, this was a failure because you didn't get X. You can't compare what we have unless you could say, we would have been better off if we had done something else. And that's the challenge that I put to the critics, which is what would you have done differently? We have become all richer. China is better off, and, and that could be good for us, right? It's created enormous potential for global growth. It's created a partner to deal with a number of other things. It's also created some problems. But we still have to think about what would the U.S. interests have been. Now, again, I think we all recognize that there needs to be adjustments to strategy. We have to deal with the fact that we were dealing with a weak China then and a stronger China now. There are different sets of problems. But to say that engagement failed means that there was a different policy that we could have pursued that would have made us better off. And I, I'm happy to have the conversation, but I'd like to hear what that would have been. Well, actually, this, this just kind of begs the question. I want to go quickly down the line, maybe a couple of, uh, just a point or two, of what should the strategy evolve into then? Um, what, what should it look like then? Professor? So, I, again, I mean, we need, first of all, to have, I think, two things that should govern our strategy, which is, one, what are our national interests, right? And what is plausible in terms of what can be done with China? You know, I, I, we've heard a lot today. I have suspicions as to why Bobby and Will put us at the end because... 
you know, this panel probably has a different perspective on some of these questions than the others. But, and I disagree with a lot that I heard say, but one of the things that I heard, which uh, Tony Thomas said, which is he characterized China's strategy as being they didn't want to be second fiddle. And by the way, I think that's a perfect characterization of China's strategy. And I asked you the question, which is, can you imagine an, an alternative strategy that China might want to pursue? I mean, when I, again, when I teach, we, I ask my students in my grand strategy class to develop grand strategies for other countries so we can see as we try to develop a grand strategy for ours what you might do. No country that has a choice will choose to be second fiddle, right? <laughs> and, and for a long time, China had no choice. And so, yes, we had, you know, Tao Gong, Yang Wei, and all that stuff. But, but China now has the opportunity to not be second fiddle, and they will pursue that. Um, we don't have to agree to that. We don't have to like that. But we have to recognize that that's what China is going to do, that it didn't like a world in which it was second fiddle, that it was oppressed, that it was, that it was a, a taker of the international order rather than a shaper of the international order. So our challenge is to recognize that whether we like it or not, that China is now in a position to contest its position as second fiddle, and for us to say what we can live with and what we can't. What are the things that they are contesting that are unacceptable to us, and what are the things they're contesting that we think are reasonable and therefore we can try to work with? And we need to be clear about that. I think that's where strategy has to be clear, is that where are our bottom lines and our red lines? What are the things that we will not give up? We will not give up our alliances. They're critical to us and to our partners. We need to make clear that we will not tolerate China's attempt to weaken them or to undermine them. Uh, but we also have to recognize that we're, we're simply not going to be able to dictate everything to China the way we could when China was weak. And I think that's the essence of the strategy we need to have now, which is to recognize we do have a near peer competitor that, will, that has the ability to influence the international environment. And we have to say, how much can we live with and how much can we not live with and make it clear to them that on those things that we can't live with, we will contest them. Kelly, on this point, you had mentioned regime type and, and changes in the Chinese regime. How does that affect the policy the U.S. should take towards China? I mean, I think at the core of when we're looking at China, we have to understand that it's the Chinese Communist Party <laughs> um, and look at the strategy through that prism because that's how they operate. Um, but I just, I agree with you and what you just said, and I would add to it, much of what we're talking about in terms of competing with China um, is going to be about us and not about them. Mm. And I think that gets lost in a lot of the sort of foreign policy discussions is that the majority of the things that we're going to have to do to be competitive with China are going to be here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's going to be education. It's going to be investing in the comparative advantages that allowed us to become the greatest military and economic power in the world. So that's the women and men in this room, uh, the students who are here. So it's innovation, education. It's making our economic model actually work again. The American dream isn't really that great right now. And I think until we perfect that economic model, you know, we're not going to win the game. We're not going to be able to compete in any domain um, if we're not solvent and strong and, uh, and have a future for next generations that is, that is compelling. Because I do think at the end of the day, the, the test of this century is going to be between our model of economic and political development and an alternative, more authoritarian model of economic and political development. And we have to win that, and that's here. Great, Chris. Um, it's hard to top those, <laughs> yeah. those two comments. I, I guess I would say, uh, perhaps turn the question around to, to think about what the strategy should be by looking at what's happening now. So one thing that's happening now is uh, what we are doing, which is we're very reactive, it seems to me. Um, to the point just made, we're focusing an awful lot of attention about what China's doing, but we're not really thinking about what we are doing or what we should be doing, and that's problematic. Um, and so, and, and to, be sh to be frank, we're having a freak out. Uh, you know, I'm quite, I'm quite surprised. You know, I thought this was a DC phenomenon, so I'm quite uh, surprised to hear that, no, it's here too. <laughs> so uh, that, that's, that's very interesting. Uh, look, I mean, you know, 20 years in the CIA, I know what an influence operation is, okay? Um, what China is doing is not an influence operation, okay? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very overt, very obvious uh, series of actions that they're taking that, in my opinion, 
we should just allow them to do because they're so absurd on the face of it. You know, it's quite striking to me. When you look at the Des Moines Register, for example, you know, one presumes, I, I don't know any Des Moinesians, but um, I presume when they look at it, they go, this doesn't sound like the regular <laughs> register. There's, maybe there's something going on here. Oh, it says brought to you by China Daily at the top right. You know, this is an influence operation. I don't think so. So calm down, you know, um, and as Jim was saying, sort out what your red lines are and then operationalize them. This has been the signal failure of the last several administrations, China policies, whether it's Scarborough Shoal or other things, you know, that, that uh, we've been failing to do. And then the, re the reverse of what we are doing is what we're not doing. We're not in TPP, <laughs> which was the answer to most of the industrial policy problems we're facing with China. And we're not working with our allies in a united front against the challenge that China presents. And then I would just close by saying, we have a choice to make in terms of how to structure the strategy because I think uh, the most fascinating thing I've heard today is the running theme about resources through all the conversations and the need to prioritize and think about resources. So we can waste a lot of time and resources largely chasing ghosts because we have a pattern for it from the Cold War or we can focus the energies and resources on the hard piece which is the, the competition with China to dominate the 21st century knowledge economy. That's where the action is, but it's hard and we don't have a template for it, so we'd rather just go after the ideological enemy stuff. Well, building on this issue of resources, uh, a recurrent theme throughout our discussion has been One Belt, One Road, BRI, uh, uh, OBOR, whatever the acronym we want to use. Um, and certainly this $1 trillion effort that China is engaged in, branded as such, um, is getting a lot of attention uh, around the world. And certainly, I study China in the developing world. So in Africa, this is uh, a big issue. The FOCAC Summit talked quite a bit about this. Um, but most of what we've heard today, uh, quite negative about the, uh, what China is doing. Um, what is China doing? Um, wh what is China doing? What does it matter for the United States? Is it good or bad for the United States? Um, can you put, put BRI in the context of the US-China relationship for us? Sure. And you know, I, I'm a Beatles fan, right? And my, my single answer to this is money can't buy you love. Oh, I thought it was let it be, <laughs> not let it be. And, but it could be let it be because, you know, I, honestly, I, I mean, if China wants to waste its money, let China waste its money. It's largely wasting its money. This is largely basically what this is. This is, this is a, a works project administration effort for unemployed Chinese workers and to get rid of Chinese excess steel. Right? I mean, that's what's happening. They're, they're basically creating jobs and, and to prop up their own uh, employment numbers. There's a lot of money being wasted. It's, there's a growing recognition within China that they're wasting a lot of money on projects that, that they're either being ripped off on or that aren't going anywhere. And the notion that somehow they're buying enormous influence, you know, we need to remember that every time we try to do this, countries just nationalized the thing after we spent all the money on it. What happened, you know, in 1953 in Iran or in the 60s in, 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 or in, in 1959 and 1960 in Cuba? The countries that are being exploited by China know they're being exploited. And when the time comes, they're going to take, take it back. Right? And we've seen this already in Malaysia and their, the recognition about what was happening there. And so I, I confess that you know, the, 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 the scale seems big. We talk about billions and billions. It's trivial in compared to the overall in, uh, infrastructure needs. CSIS has done a wonderful piece of analysis on just really what a drop in the bucket this thing is. So the notion that somehow they're buying this vast influence and we've got to worry that they're at our shores because they're, they're in bed with Maduro, they can have Maduro as far as I'm <laughs> concerned because, because we saw what happened to Citgo, right? And we saw what happened to the American investments there. So the notion that they're buying something that's of strategic threat to us in Africa, that they're locking this stuff up, they are going to be as vulnerable to the, the problems of, of charges of exploitation within those societies as the imperialists were in earlier days vis-a-vis -vis China. So, you know, I am a bit in let it be. I mean, I do think we have to worry, and there was some very good conversation about this earlier, about the need that we do need to be more responsive. We need to have effective aid programs. But by the way, you know, one of the things we learned, and I was very involved in this in the, in the um, Obama administration, is that you know, we, we know that Pakistan has a lot of infrastructure needs, needs to deal with. But honestly, if they aren't going to be able to organize their government and deal with the corruption, and, the, and it, it doesn't, sinking all this money into it isn't going to help. So I think, again, this goes to, I think, what is our common theme here is we need to think about what we do in our interest and not be so frightened about all these things, this sort of litany of horrors that we're facing, that they're at our shores and they're going to own the Panama Canal. And, you know, I, I do think we've, we, we're 
so worried about missing the boat on the threat that somehow we've been sleeping while you know China woke that we that we're failing to distinguish what are the real problems and Kelly's talked about them and others have talked about them which are real I, I don't mean to suggest at all that there aren't real serious dangers here and especially the attempt uh, of China to intimidate our allies and to weaken our alliances I think is a big concern but we need to focus on that and not you know create the specter that somehow a few billion dollars of Chinese aid through through the Belt and Road Initiative is, is going to undermine our national security. Yes, I agree with Jim. I do think, though, that uh, the two best weapons we have with BRI are transparency and collective action. So transparency is working with, you know, our friends and allies to impose, you know, to show, you know, local countries what is actually being presented to them. So and exposing, you know, the terms of the investments that China is offering to these countries. And once countries start to realize, you know, maybe country X had more than country Y in terms of a debt deal, and that's going to create a, a whole lot of problems for China down the road. So I actually think shining a light uh, and putting some transparency on what China's doing is going to be hugely effective um, with, with some of this. The other piece is, um, again, working with, with collectively with our friends, like the Japanese in particular, um, who have a strong interest, particularly in South and, and Southeast Asia, with India as well, uh, and partnering with them to figure out how we can provide an alternative uh, and attractive um, investment <laughs> that these countries can choose from. Because right now, we're not really showing up. The United States isn't showing up very much um, in this space. Part of it is because some of the tools that we have are, are uh, atrophying at Exim Bank. We should, I mean, we, we don't do development finance, which is a real problem. Well, the Build Act. Well, yeah. well, that, you know, we'll see how that goes. Um, <laughs> But you know, that is a real problem. Like American companies aren't even bidding on projects and infrastructure projects in these countries because they don't, you know, have the financing for it. So, and don't want to take the risk. So I think we need to be uh, providing an alternative, working with partners like the Japanese and the Indians who sh do share our, our values and our interests vis-a-vis um, -vis China. Uh, and putting some more transparency on, on the And just one footnote on that, which I completely agree with. We've, we're all lamenting the things that we could have, should have done. One of them is we should have joined the AIIB, yeah. and we should have been yeah. a voice within the AIIB for transparency and for this and yep. for the DAC principles and all that stuff, yep. as opposed to just leaving it you know, free to China. Yeah. Chris, did you want uh, to jump Just in here? a couple quick points. I mean, I, I guess uh, I'll, I'll break up the, the radical agreement by being a little darker about, <laughs> about, <laughs> about BRI. And, and it's from this perspective. We, we did a study at CSIS on it when it first was announced, I think, uh, very early on. And uh, one, <laughs> of, one of the things we tried to do with the study was there was a lot of, and there still is, a lot of commentary about um, it's a bad neighborhood, you know, in Central Asia. There's a lot of these problems. You can't find it. The financing's horrible. It just but our goal is sort of to try to figure out, well, what is this thing? You know, where did it come from? How meaningful is it? And, you know, what should we think about it? And so, you know, we had sort of three main conclusions. The first one was what Jim had highlighted earlier, which, you know, if you were doing a balance between um, economics and geostrategic gamesmanship, it was probably 90-10, you know, uh, in favor of economics, you know, getting rid of a lot of sort of overcapacity and so on. The second, which is a very obvious one, is that it is Xi Jinping's signature foreign policy initiative, and therefore it is too big to fail, right? So they're going to keep at it. And the, the third one really was this idea of, um, you know, yeah, they want to pick up some geostrategic benefits along the way. I'll say that, you know, now, God, five years hence, somewhere in that neighborhood, um, I think that we're seeing a turn in some of the projects that they're looking at that do have a far more overt geostrategic angle to them. I would simply add, though, that the reason why they've done that is because they perceive an open playing field because of our absence. And then I would just really echo what Jim said. I, every now and again, you get a stream from the administration suggesting they're about to come out and fundamentally oppose Belt and Road as opposed to just, you know, working with partners and so on to present an alternative. That would be a policy error of the same magnitude of the difference between AAIB as an institution and Belt and Road as an institution. Interesting. Well, let me, let me change subjects here since we've all been uh, in agreement. Engagement was good. The BRI is not to be worried about except for Chris's caveat at the end. And turn to something that might be a little bit more uh, uh, 
maybe a testing question. And let me turn to you first, Kelly, because you worked on South China Sea. Um, <laughs> China has been building well, islands well. on reefs. It's been <laughs> yes. uh, uh, opposing our freedom of, of navigation. Mm -hmm. um, there were, I believe yesterday I saw a couple of uh, ships, U.S. ships, pass through the Taiwan Strait. Um, tell us what's going on in the South China Sea. How do you see this issue evolving? Um, and what should U.S. policy be in this kind of crux of the great power rivalry? So, yes, I worked on the South China Sea. It didn't go very well. Um, so <laughs> caveat everything I say. Um, no, I, I, I think, you know, what we're doing right now is the appropriate thing. I think freedom of navigation and demonstrating the importance of that um, with these operations is, is very important. Getting others to do the same is going to be even more important down the road as, as the Chinese continue to sort of push and test uh, whether or not we're going to stand up for a, a rules-based order. So that is part one, but that's not a strategy, right? Bond ops are not a strategy. But, um, you know, I think it's important that they continue and be regular and not sort of perceived as one-offs. Um, but really, I think the long game in the South China Sea is actually with our partners, um, and it's capacity building. It's, you know, ensuring that uh, these st uh, the states, you know, have... Uh, maritime surveillance capacity so that they can monitor their own waters and fisheries and see what people are doing. It's building out, you know, sort of a common operating picture amongst Southeast Asian nations and that's going to be the long game. And we started doing that uh, in the Obama administration that's continued into the Trump administration um, through an initiative uh, from Senator McCain, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think that is a really important piece of this. Um, and, of course, the diplomatic aspects of, you know, pursuing... Um, you know, one, one big mistake I think we made uh, in the Obama administration on South China Sea was after the arbitral tribunal ruling happened, uh, I don't think we actually um, did enough diplomatically to leverage that uh, in the region. I think uh, we were too, way too cautious um, about pursuing that um, in ASEAN and, and with others uh, in the region. So I do think that's sort of where we got ahead. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, China is going to have these islands. They're going to use them for military purposes, but we have to put the choice to China. China is going to have to be the one to, you know, fire the first shot. So we're going to just keep sailing, you know, as close as we can legally. And if, you know, it's going to be their decision to escalate uh, militarily. And I think so we just keep on going and just keep doing it. And it puts the choice to them and it kind of neutralizes the argument. Mm -hmm. You're not, get, you're not getting the disagreement you want here, right? Um, you know, because I, I do think that um, there, you know, we, the, the issue of the, the who owns the territory is a disputed one. The United States has not taken a position for good reason. It's not, we don't have a view, we don't have a claim. But we do have a set of interests here that, that need to be enforced, and freedom of navigation is an enormously important set of interests here. But we should not, we should recognize, as Kelly suggested, that we can put the, the, the shoe on their foot, right? When China declared an air defense identification zone over the East China Sea, we said, excuse me, I didn't hear you, yeah. <laughs> right? And we kept flying, and, and it, it demonstrated the Chinese did nothing about it because they recognized that they were not going to escalate the conflict. I think we have to be very clear that we, are, we will not tolerate interference with freedom of navigation. We need to work with our allies. We need to build a capacity. But I think you know, we, we would clearly prefer that they not militarize the islands. I think it is, it, it, it is a problem for China that having said that it, they would not, they went ahead. I think China pays a big price, frankly, for doing those things. And I think the price they pay for doing it is much more severe than the risk to us of their having it. I mean, I don't, again, I've talked to military colleagues about it. There are operational consequences for their having these capacities there. But we, we should also remember that if there were a conflict, these operational capacities would be worth nothing, right, because they would be gone in a heartbeat. Um, and so it is, is being clear about what we object to and what we think is unhelpful. We need to insist that Ch and keep the spotlight on China's destabilizing actions. We should insist on working with ASEAN towards a code of conduct in the South China Sea. We should make it clear that China is the barrier to achieving that. These are all our advantages, and to keep our advantages in our hand and make China be the one who's destabilizing the region. Chris, let me top that up a bit for you. 
Uh, the quadrilateral dialogue was just held again uh, mm -hmm. in uh, Pap Papua New Guinea, was it, or Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about what, if any, role the quadrilateral might play in, in addressing some of the issues that uh, uh, Kelly and Jim just mentioned? I, I, think, there, I think there's a lot of hope uh, that, that it will do so. Um, in my own discussions, with, <laughs> which happens ceaselessly in a think tank, with the quad partners, um, we find that two of the quad partners in particular spend a lot of time attacking each other um, and not a lot of time thinking about um, the challenge from China, so it's a bit frustrating. Um, and, and I think we need to understand that in some ways, especially with India, the challenge we face is the Indians are happy to talk about the South China Sea. They want us in the Indian Ocean. Mm -hmm. That's where they want us. <laughs> and then we're not there from their point of view. They want us to see over that horizon. And that's their goal. So they'll play along and play footsie in the South China Sea and so on, but they really want us over there. So there's some fundamental problems, I think, in, in that infrastructure. Let me just say a few words about the, the broader South China Sea challenge. I, I think um, I, I'm a lot more pessimistic, I think, in part because you, know, you, you never want to focus on, these things happen over long periods of time. You never want to focus on a single decision point of failure or, or, or success. But the Scarborough incident, I think, really doesn't get enough attention. Um, I, I can't tell you how many times I'm in China and talk to all people all over the system, military, all the others. Uniformly, they say, we cannot, we cannot believe that you didn't push back. Um, and actually, yeah, so, so basically 2012, uh, a territory that was previously under the control of the Philippines, the Scarborough Shoal. The Chinese got themselves in there. There was a lot of mix-up, a lot of potential for conflict. We had an agreement that everybody would just go away under the guise of a approaching uh, typhoon. Um, the Filipinos left, and the Chinese stayed, and it's still under their control. Um, and so the problem was the signal it sent to them about U.S. resolve, U.S. consistency. And I think they would have done everything they've done, but they would have done it over 25 years instead of one. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> and that's a very big strategic difference. The second piece is there's a lot of work, including work done by CSIS, that focuses on you know, aircraft revetments and SAMs and things like this. And as Jim was just saying, boom, gone in you know, five minutes in any real conflict. The real worrisome bit, and we're starting to see them do this now, is they're putting their most sophisticated EW and battle management gear and jamming gear down there, which creates a hell of a problem for us in any Taiwan scenario. Forget about South China Sea, um, because of course in the 95-96 crisis, we sailed two carrier battle groups through there completely unimpeded. That would not be the case today. So, um, and, and then the challenge, I think, policy-wise that we face with it is, you really have a choice between acquiescence and rollback. And you know, rollback's pretty ugly. Uh, we can do all the fun ops we want, and I support those, and I think we need to continue doing them. I, I hope we'll start doing them, and we are now, I believe. Forget about this innocent passion stuff. Just ram it down there, you know. Um, and uh, but, I think we need to do a lot more, also in sort of the black space, that shows them there are consequences for those decisions down there. Well, that's great, and actually sets me up for my final question before I turn to you, students out there, for your good questions. So get them all ready, um, and that's the Taiwan question. Um, for a few years, it seemed that Taiwan was actually an issue that was more or less taking care of itself. It seemed it was becoming less of a crisis point um, under Ma Ying-jeou and the previous administration. Um, now we see uh, a more provocative Chinese disposition towards Taiwan. We see an end to the so-called diplomatic truce, uh, which uh, are unofficial diplomatic truce. Um, and we see uh, the president of Taiwan, Tsai Ing-wen, saying she is facing influence operations. She is facing uh, fake news. She is facing, and she is saying this uh, in a way which, to me, at least, I don't know about the panel, uh, is believable. Mm. Um, so can we talk a little bit about what uh, is at stake at the, in the Taiwan crisis, what's the developments in the, in the Taiwan, not the crisis, the straits, in the Taiwan straits, um, and what is the propensity for crisis? Is this a, something we should be worried about, um, or is it something which um, do you think over time is going to work its way out as we did feel a few years ago? I do so start, I, I mean, I, you should, one should never be uh, overly complacent about the <laughs> Taiwan situation. It, it always has the risk of becoming a very serious crisis, and as we touched on several times here, having lived through the 75, 76 crisis, it was a crisis, and it was very severe. Um, the, for better or for worse, 
the Chinese leadership fundamentally believes that the DPP and Tsai Ing-wen have as their goal independence. They've thought this even before the DPP was the DPP and Li Dongwei was the, was the president of, of China. They will never accept this. And, and she gives them enough reason by not agreeing to the 92 consensus and to, to make it possible within their internal deliberations just to be convinced that, th that their secret objective is independence. And, and that then requires the leadership in Beijing to deter that by raising the threats, by raising the set of activities, and raising the tensions. That, in turn, of course, requires Tsai Ing-wen and the forces in Taiwan to respond to that. Um, I, am totally, I, I, I totally understand why the DPP is in the position that it is and feels that, that China should deal with it on its own terms, so long as they don't declare independence. Uh, but they have their own constituencies. There are deep greens and there are you know, moderate greens. and. And so it's a, it's a fraught environment in which everybody is trying to, I think, I, I, do, I do not believe that China wants to force the issue, but I also believe that China, that no Chinese leadership in the Communist Party can ever be the one who lost Taiwan. And, and they can't, and so they, they can't wait till it's too late, right? And which means they overreact to what's going on. So that's what makes it so dangerous. And it makes really subtle, effective management by the United States very clear. People have been criticizing for all, since 1978, the so-called strategic ambiguity. It's been an enormous success, right? <laughs> and, and it comes from the fact that we have been able to manage the fact that we've convinced each side that they risk losing our support if they go too far. And, and we can't be too precise about what that would be because part of the deterrence comes from the ambiguity. We've all studied shelling and all that good stuff. So it's very, very hard to do. And I hope that there is an understanding and a sensitivity in the Trump administration, whatever the other objectives are and whatever else it's trying to do in its China strategy, that this requires a tremendous amount of delicacy. We cannot abandon Taiwan. Uh, we cannot, uh, I mean, we don't have a, a formal uh, commitment, but my good friend and mentor, uh, Sandy Berger, always said to me, my view is we would not stand idly by and I believe that's right. And China needs to know that. Uh, but it's also true that, that Tsai Ing-wen and DPP has to know that it's not a license to be a provocative at any cost. And the United States has to be able to do that kind of very subtle diplomacy backed up by military things, including arms sales. We got into a lot of trouble uh, in, uh, with our relations with China in 2010 for continuing the arms sales, but that is a part of it. Thank you. I would just add, I mean, I think I worry a lot about uh, Taiwan. But one thing that China is already doing with Taiwan is basically trying to smother it uh, economically with a pillow. <laughs> um, so they're, you know, they are essentially, <laughs> right? Or exactly. Um, but the, you know, they'll, they'll lure uh, young Taiwanese uh, to come work in China, and in China, frankly, the salaries are a lot higher than they are in Taiwan, and so they end up staying. And so it's like brain drain is happening significantly right now in Taiwan. So I, I worry about this, the slow play that's happening now. Um, I think the Chinese are kind of already in it uh, with political influence. Uh, I do believe there's a lot of fake news uh, problems going on in Taiwan, uh, especially in the last uh, most recent election. So uh, I think it's a real, a real issue. And I think, uh, you know, also there's a generational, you know, young, you speak to anyone. I was just in Taiwan a couple months ago, you know, all young people, they identify themselves as Taiwanese. Yeah. And that's a real problem for Beijing. <laughs> like, absorbing Taiwan is not going to be cost-free for Beijing because <laughs> they're going to have a population of people who don't have the memories of their parents and their grandparents of being part of a unified China. And they see themselves as their own national identity. <laughs> and so if China ever did try to invade the island, they'd have a real problem. Um, so... I think, you know, they're trying, I think the Chinese know that, and that's why they're trying to implement this sort of more subtle approach right now, combined with sort of, you know, the sort of military pressure you're, you're starting to see uh, them sort of saber rattling. Because they know that it's a, it's a problem that's not going to be solved their way. I think they know that. I mean, one quick thing to add to that was when I was in Taiwan, I heard about we were watching Hong Kong closely, mm -hmm. right? So it seems that the Hong Kong yeah. uh, uh, crackdown seemed to influence their perceptions. Uh, Chris, I, I, you can jump in. Well, I, I just on that specific point, uh, you know, um, when I look at the Beijing's management of the Hong Kong situation, uh, 
with my CCP goggles on, <laughs> you know, I can understand most of what they do. Yeah. But the one thing that makes no sense is the demonstration effect for Taiwan, right? Yeah. You know, which is if this is one country, two systems, no thank you, right? Yeah. And, and I think that's, I cannot get my mind around that one, try as I might. The, the other couple points I'd make is I, I think exactly the slow boil is their approach. It's, it's moving to like a medium boil. Uh, the diplomatic allies thing is particularly concerning. And there's a real, I was just there right before the election in Taiwan, and it was really striking. There's a real debate on do they want to zero us out or just, you know, and, and they're really struggling with that. And then the fake news thing was quite striking. We received a one-hour briefing uh, on it, oh, and yeah. they were showing us all these examples. And, you know, I mean, I knew it was going on, but it's really scary when you look at the, uh, the, the, the elements of it. And, in fact, I think it should concern us as well because some of it is yeah. test bedding for um, future activities. Yeah. Yeah. I have to say, though, I mean, uh, the fake news thing is worse. On the diplomatic allies, you know, my advice to my Taiwanese friends have always been, you're playing on China's field if yeah. you do this. I mean, the, if you think about it, we have a very weak argument. We're telling Panama, well, we don't recognize Taiwan, but it's terrible that you've stopped <laughs> recognizing them. I mean, this is just, it's not a very credible thing. I feel badly. I know how much it hurts Taiwan to lose these things. But I think that, I, I, you know, Taiwan should play to its strengths mm -hmm. and think about the things where it can, you know, ha hold high the banner, its democracy, its vibrant society. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what, it, no longer true, but when I was still in office, you know, they, one of their proud achievements was they were uh, allied with, with um, the, the brutal regime in Liberia, right, yeah. before the, the democracy uh, was there. And, you know, yes, you have a diplomatic partner, but that's the good news. The bad news is that they're horrible like, human yeah. rights violators. <laughs> and, and is that good for what you are? So, um, I, I, you know, Taiwan has to figure out how it plays to its strengths right. and keeps the, the global support. It, in the end of the day, the thing that will most, I think, deter mm. China is the sense that China would pay a price, mm. not just in the resistance, which would be fierce, mm -hmm. but also but that there would be really be a significant international reaction. And that will happen so long as the world understands Taiwan to be a, 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 a country that believes in human freedom, believes in democracy, supports those principles, and advocates it, is out doing, supporting human rights in other countries, is doing humanitarian work and things like that. And just to amplify that real quickly, I think, you know, the struggle that's happening within Taiwan as well is, you know, the big question, the democracy stuff aside, is how do we get out of the economic vortex? You know, you mentioned the people going to China and so on. And you do that, you sign an FTA with Japan, the United mm -hmm. States, and Europe as quickly as you can. Taiwan has a very protectionist economy <laughs> domestically. Um, yes. uh, and, and they, as an island trading nation, they need to change that very fundamentally and very fast. Well, that's a great point. It's actually a, a we haven't talked about the, the, the so-called trade war and other things. We're, we're here talking about mostly security and politics, but maybe our uh, audience has some questions along those lines. Um, so let me open it up here. Um, yeah, over here. Uh, we need a microphone, please. Yeah. So my name is Claire. Thank you so much for the talk. It was fantastic. Um, I'm a student at LBJ in the law school, so thank you for talking to us students. My question is not to do with trade. I'm so sorry, but it's more <laughs> pertaining to the idea of regional spheres of influence. Um, so there are powers that fall solidly within the U.S. camp, powers that fall solidly within China's camp, and those that work very hard not to be in the exclusive purview of either. If the United States continues to not show up in the region, how are those spheres going to change? And what does that do to America's role in the region? So thank you. Easy question. <laughs> <laughs> Professor? We've got great students. <laughs> oh, I'm, oh, I got this one. Okay. Um, well, I, th I think we are showing up. We need to show up more yeah. um, and be present uh, in the region for the foreseeable future. Um, so that's really important and, and to have an alternative. Um, I think, you know, Ensuring that there is no regional hegemon in Asia is going to be profoundly important uh, over the next century. And we were successful in doing that when China didn't have the capacity to dominate, uh, but they now will have that capacity. And so it's going to be especially important uh, that we work collectively uh, with our you know, core democratic allies, uh, Japan, Australia, uh, Korea, and others, but also build out partnerships. And... You know, some of the best work that, frankly, I did towards the end of the administration was 
really trying to build more defense relationships in South and Southeast Asia and build them out. Um, and it was kind of a peripheral strategy. I mean, you can call it containment, but, you know. Um, and that the purpose of it, though, was so that they had alternative, an alternative choice uh, between, you know, not just having China be the only choice. And I, so that's true on the security side, and that's true economically as well. We have to provide alternative choices uh, to these countries um, so that they're not left with one choice. So I think this is kind of the most important fundamental principle as we're looking at Asia is that you don't want to have a dominant hegemon in the region economically or strategically. So it's a good question. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that 100%. I, I, and in fact, I think this is the signal uh, achievement of the Obama administration in the region was the focus on Southeast Asia uh, because that is the battleground for, for this. Um, one thing that concerns me very deeply about the current administration's approach is that increasingly we are going to those countries and we're telling them, you need to make a choice. It's us or China. And they fundamentally don't want to do it, number one. <laughs> and number two, we may not like the answer they give us because of our inconsistency. Jim, did you want yeah, to no, I, I mean, I think the good news for us is with the possible exception of Cambodia, perhaps Laos, and to a little degree, Myanmar, nobody's choosing to be China's ally, right? This is, I mean, and ours, we're not forcing them to do it. They, they want to be associated with us. And so this is our great strength, and we need to build on it. Everybody's piled on in TPP. It's so self-evident, not just on economic, but on political grounds. But, but we can't, Chris has made a really important point, which is we cannot make this, it's, it, it, you have to have a monogamous relationship, you have to be only with us. They're not going to do it. They have too much at stake, and, and we shouldn't want them to, right? We don't want this to be turned into a new Cold War. This would be a mistake. It's actually better. The best thing that's happened to the United States in recent months is uh, Prime Minister Abe going to Beijing. This is good. We want countries have a good relationship with China, but to not be intimidated or coerced by China. And that's why we need to be there, because they can have a good relationship with China that's not uh, a subservient or, or a coerced relationship if we're there. And then we do get the benefit of all these interconnections. You know, one of the things, uh, we haven't talked about grand strategy enough here from my perspective, but one of the, my greatest fears now is we're now starting to talk about policies and strategies of disengagement, where we have less and less to do with each other. <laughs> And somehow, because it's going to reduce our vulnerabilities, oh, they're holding our debt, we're vulnerable. We're trading with them, they're vulnerable. Quite the opposite. The best thing we have going for us on both sides is our mutual vulnerability and our mutual interdependence. It is a buffer on what are natural tensions between two powerful countries. And we need to be very careful not to encourage this disengagement, but actually to recognize in, in very classic you know, political theory sense, that this does act as a reason for us to try to resolve problems rather than having little stake at managing the differences. I think one thing that's just come out from these answers that's worth putting my finger on for a moment is that, that these countries, these other countries, not the major powers, but the other countries are selecting, they're choosing, they're protecting their autonomy. They don't want to choose between the yeah. two. That a lot of choice resides in their hands. And I think from the perspective of some IR theorists, we would think of great powers and material gain equals hegemony. But it seems that there are real choices that other countries have to make in the region. Um, and I, th I thought I kind of got that a little bit. Yeah, we, we learned this from dealing with France during the Cold War. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's okay not to have them do everything that we want them to do in the end because they are there because it's their choice. Mm -hmm. It makes for a much more valuable ally. Mm -hmm. The new aligned, non-aligned movement. Yeah. Um, okay, wow. This seems like the table uh, over <laughs> here. Like table. Yeah. But maybe, maybe we'll take you three in, in succession because you're three students, so we've got to... Hi there. Uh, my name is Ashish Dave. I'm a freshman student here at UT. Thank you for the discussion. It was fantastic. Um, so my question is regarding uh, militarily, you know, military action specifically. So obviously we've seen China defy international ruling on territorial waters, um, unilaterally expanding its influence, and then we continue to see, um, you know, its, its expansion using its ships uh, within the South China Sea. My question is, do you ever foresee the United States meaningfully responding to provocation? And whether yes or no, which regional allies must we concentrate on building relationships with to deter them from ever taking meaningful action? So if I understand the question, you're asking whether or not we would, we would 
defend Maybe ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yes, I think we would. Uh, I spent a lot of time on this, uh, a lot of time on the plans. Um, so the answer is, I mean, obviously, if if China took an aggressive action against you know U.S. military vessel or uh, personnel, we would clearly uh, defend ourselves uh, in the region. Um, and if they attacked one of our allies, a treaty ally, certainly, uh, again, you know, President Obama, you know, clarified that in the case of Japan and then uh, the Senkakus. So I think that is, uh, that's core to, you know, our pillar of security uh, in the region is that our alliance relationships are there. The most important ally, I think all of them are important, uh, frankly. Um, we're at a stage where we need to be better networking those allies together. Um, so, for example, Japan and Australia have very capable uh, technology and, and industry, and their military is very capable. So knitting together uh, that capacity in the region is going to be the, the next wave of, I think, American security engagement. It's going to be taking the alliance relationships we've already built over the last 70 years and tying them together more systematically. Uh, and we started doing that, and there, that's still ongoing, whether it's through the Quad or through trilateral uh, defense cooperation, which is happening with Japan and Korea, um, or Japan and Australia as well. So doing some of that more systematically, um, that's going to be the wave of the future. And then also connecting those democratic capable allies in Asia to our democratic and capable allies in Europe, mm. um, which is an under developed part of the strategy uh, with that we need to get on because I think uh, Europe is also just starting to come to understand the scope of the China challenge and we haven't engaged our European allies enough uh, on this particular issue. So that's, so networking is the, the next wave. Just two minutes. I, the, I think the fall and natural fall on to that is it's, this also speaks to the resources issue, right? You know, the, we have a project at CSIS called Federated Defense that we're working on. We have to radically overhaul our FMS uh, process. We have to radically overhaul how we handle defense technology transfer and integration and so on um, because uh, we don't have the, the, the resources unilaterally to sustain that. So, uh, and, and the partners are willing and capable, as, as we just heard. Um, I'm Soren. I'm also a freshman. Um, I'll be quick. Uh, relating to the engagement you spoke about, um, today we've heard a lot about military engagement, intelligence, security, and I was curious, um, since China hasn't been particularly friendly to us, as we move forward, what role will diplomacy, citizen diplomacy, or diplomacy by foreign services officers play in securing a future that's good for America? Thanks. Role of diplomacy, sir. You know, it's, you wouldn't be surprised from the State Department guy to say that uh, <laughs> Diplomacy matters. But I, I, I actually, you touched on a little bit about the civilian diplomacy. One of the things that's really important um, is the people to people side of this. Um, you know, that one of the single, the, the two big differences between the problems we have now with uh, China versus the problems we have in the Soviet Union is one, we have this economic interdependence which gives us a stake in each other, which we did not have with the Soviet Union. But second, we have much more people to people interaction here. You know, and I have to say, we've had a lot of talk here, talk of here about influence operations and Confucius Institutes and stuff. But you know, I have a lot of Chinese students. I'm not worried about them. I'm glad to have them because it's an opportunity for them to see what we're doing and hear how we talk about and debate issues. And I go over and teach in China a lot because I want to talk to Chinese students and I want our students to go over to China. This is enormously important. I mean, because it is it it creates an environment where the ideas are there. And it's the greatest, by the way, antidote to the Great Firewall of China, because it's the one thing that they can't, if they let the students come over here, they're going <laughs> to hear it, right? They're going to hear it from you, as well as from their professors. And they get to, they get to, I, I know there are people worried that they're, uh, you know, in enclaves on our campuses, and we need to do a better job to make sure that the Chinese students don't just interact with each other. We're all, all, all our campuses are dealing with those kinds of issues. But I think that the, the, the interaction is so important. I mean, and I and I must say, you know, I know we're worried about the the sort of the Chinese ideology and the like. And the Chinese students I know, most of them are patriotic in the sense that they, they believe in their country, they want well for their country and their people. But they are not I mean, they're not robots, mm -hmm. you know, and they, they do listen and hear and they see. And so I think this is so important that as we, we have to protect some technologies, there may be some labs we can't let them into, but we need to keep this openness. Mary Beth 
touched on this before, but it's so vital. I would take the risk. I would take the risk, you know, except for a very, 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 very small numbers of our technologies. Yes, they're going to steal it. Yes, they've got people over here who have assignments to go get this. Fine. That's who we are. We're open, right? And we're going to win at this by staying open and having these interactions. And diplomacy facilitates that. It allows us to have more interchange. I go over to China a lot. I have no illusions that I'm persuading them at all, but I want them to hear from me. And I want to hear from them, frankly. I mean, and I, I must say that, that one of the things that I wasn't hearing a lot of today is hearing from the Chinese leaders. We, we sort of treat them as sort of these devious figures who are out to undermine us and sneakily having this. No, they're actually political leaders in their own system who are trying to manage a lot of problems. And when you talk to them and hear from them, you understand this. You may not agree. You may violently disagree. And in our diplomacy, by the way, we violently disagree a lot. This is not lovey-dovey or panda-hugging that goes on when striped pants State Department folks go over there. We tell it like it is, right? And we tell them what the consequences are. But we don't refuse to talk to them. I'd just like to add to that that the LBJ School has great Chinese students. Uh, we have exchange students, and some of my best students are Excellent. Chinese students. So I completely concur <laughs> with that, um, especially at a place like the LBJ School, right. a place where you teach uh, public policy. Right. So um, any other comments on that point? We'll let the State Department <laughs> take, pick it up. And uh, this, uh, the, the third of the musketeers. So as a musketeer, I'm also a freshman here at UT. My, <laughs> name, <laughs> my name is Nicola, and I'd like to ask, so. China recently ended its one-child policy, and it's facing an aging population, and it has a massive gender disbalance. So I want to ask, how does these demographic transitions in China, how does that affect the calculus in dealing with a long-term plan for the China challenge, as he said? Great question. Demographics. <laughs> I didn't know I was a demographer, but right. uh, <laughs> <laughs> apparently so. Um, You're the intel. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, the Terminator, I guess, is their answer. No, uh, <laughs> lots of robots. So that, that seems to be how they're thinking about. It. No, it's a it's a serious problem. Um, and of course, you know, they now basically acknowledge the the uh, foolishness of the one child policy, right? And they've abandoned it, and they're trying to go back. But they figured out that, you know, their society is uh, doing what most societies do: is they get wealthy, which is to have fewer children, especially with property being very expensive and jammed, and and so on, so on. So that that policy's not going to work. Uh, I think it's going to create a lot more pressure for us. This is why I think this, this issue, that's why I highlighted in my remarks earlier this issue of sort of how do we deal with the competition over this 21st century knowledge-based economy, because that's really going to be where the action is, um, primarily because the demographic gift, as it's often called, that they've enjoyed for the last 30, 40 years is turning into a demographic burden very quickly. You know, you hear the throwaway line a lot, they've got to get rich before they get old, and you know, so on and so on. But these are really fundamental um, challenges that they're facing. And frankly, I think it's going to do certain things. You know, we, we make a lot of straight line assumptions. It's a danger in the business. One of those is the military powers increase. They're not going to have anyone to put in the, <laughs> in the fighter aircraft and so on. Um, so it's a, it's a fundamental challenge that they're facing. And frankly, the government doesn't have a good policy response other than try to move up that value chain as quickly as you possibly can, you know, to try to counteract some of that. And unfortunately, their model, you know, their playbook only has a few pages in it. So I think it's actually going to intensify these challenges that we're facing, you know, between the two countries on the trade and economic stuff. Uh, do either of you want to weigh in on that? Okay, let's turn it back. Uh, all right, this gentleman over here. It's coming. <laughs> Oh, thank, thank. Oh, that's okay. Uh, thank you'll you. be next. We'll get him next. We'll get him next. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I just have a very curious question. Uh, since the process seems to be shrouded in, in not much transparency at all, uh, what's the process or experience like working with uh, Chinese state officials? Do you uh, get to know any of them personally, or is it very much uh, just a very business-oriented, uh, stoic uh, work environment whenever you do? Uh, meet or negotiate with uh, Chinese officials? I can say from my experience, because I dealt with the PLA, uh, <laughs> <laughs> a little different. Um, it was very just business. Um, we would have occasional social dinners, but the PLA officers were not in the sort of sherry, chatty uh, <laughs> mode. Um, and also dealing with me as a female in a defense, senior yeah. defense position, they just sort of marveled at me. Um, <laughs> Serious. I mean, they, they, many of them asked me, like, why aren't you just married and oh, having gosh. children? It's very awkward. Um, <laughs> so, so yes. Um, but, yeah, PLA, I think, is very different 
then I think I, yeah, I, I suspect I, you have much more yeah, uh, I, I, nuanced I have engagement. To say I mean, <laughs> I one has no illusions. I mean, they, they are government <laughs> officials, right? They have to represent their country, but they also recognize, and I do think this is, goes back to your question, right, which is that, you know, just reading the, the, the talking points and the note cards isn't going to get them anywhere. And, and I, I believe uh, over time that I've, I've had a lot of personal relationships with senior leaders that I've learned a lot from them. I, I, I don't expect them to betray their country or tell me things they're not supposed to tell me. I know that they're under constraints. But I, 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 I have had the experience of knowing them as individuals and human beings. I met their families. I mean, I, mm -hmm. it, and so there is this level, I think, especially if you've been doing it. You know, it's now been 25 years since I had my first uh, diplomatic engagement uh, with China. And so, I mean, some of the people uh, who I first knew as junior officers when I was a fairly junior officer are, are now very, very senior people. And so it is important and it's valuable and it's useful, especially in moments of crisis. In, the, in 2010, uh, when the, we had a pretty serious downturn in, in U.S.-China relations after President Obama's visit, and we decided to go forward with uh, arms sales to Taiwan and to meet with the Dalai Lama, it was pretty tense. And they imposed sanctions and they cut off dialogues. And Jeff Bader, who's even more experienced than I at this, went over and spent uh, several days in, in Beijing. And we were able to, to go to places and to have conversations with people that, that were different in kind, I think, than what Kelly was talking about. And where you could really, again, without you know, somehow betraying your country or not, being consistent with, with your guidance from your leadership, to, un, to, to be able to have somewhat more of an honest and open kind of conversation. I, I, I'll just say I've had both experiences. So, so you know, de dealing with the intelligence opposite numbers, yeah, not a lot of love uh, going on there. Uh, although uh, the intelligence business is unique in that there's a certain um, brotherhood element to it, I suppose, you know, where, um, in fact, you can have very candid conversations with them sometimes. Uh, and that back channel issue that Jim raised is exceptionally important, obviously, in the intelligence channel. And then, you know, others, mainly since I've left government, uh, I've actually developed, yeah, very, very good relationships with them. Some, some of them are very senior also because of my time 20 plus years ago in the embassy. You know, those same, uh, most of them, like me, have gone nowhere, but, <laughs> but a few of them have gone very high. Um, and that's important. But, and I think the main issue is uh, what I find really valuable is they're curious. You know, as you were saying earlier, Jim, they're curious. They want to try to figure this out. They have a policy system that they need to explain this stuff to, you know, and try, try to get some, some angles. So there, there are meaningful conversations. I will say I think that has gotten a lot tougher in the last five years. That's definitely the case. The only thing I would add to that is that I do think there's also a generational difference. Uh, when I've dealt with younger folks and dealt with them in Chinese, I feel that's a much more open dialogue mm. than when I deal with people who are a couple of generations older and uh, who don't have much experience externally. So I and, think that and I, I also, I mean, having given you a fairly <coughs> optimistic view of this, I mean, I do agree with Chris on this last point. It has gotten worse. I mean, it has definitely gotten worse. And it's gotten worse not just in, in official channels, yeah. it's also gotten worse in, in non-official channels, yeah. which is very worse. I mean, people who I've known, academics and think tank types who I've known for 25 years, yeah. who I had very, very open and candid mm. relationships with, there's a lot more caution on the Chinese side. This is worrisome. I mean, we've, we've said some less, I think this panel is somewhat less alarmist than some of the earlier ones, but I, will, I, I don't want to underestimate the negative side of the Xi Jinping era. This is way, way, way more repressive of individual freedom and liberty than what we had seen in the previous 20 years. And, you know, I don't think it's sustainable, frankly, but one should not, I don't want to give any impression that I don't think it's terribly worrisome. They, the view from the leadership now, and, and she is very much that there is no room yeah. for free thought. And, and we're seeing this, and it becomes, it's just across the board, the, the sense of fear. People are not necessarily towing the line completely. They're just being really cautious, right? They just don't want to say anything about anything. And that really hurts dialogue. Yeah. Indeed. <laughs> OK, uh, last question. Uh, hi, thanks for your time. My name is Parth. I'm a junior here at uh, UT. A lot of the previous speakers and panelists have been very critical of US companies, particularly technology companies, that are working in China. Um, critics say that they are working in a way that undermines US interests and also supports uh, China's more nefarious uh, activities. Uh, do you think these, do you all see, see this as a problem as well? And if so, is this a problem that the U.S. government should try to curtail either through legislation or regulation? Take a stab at it. Uh, I, I think it is a problem. Um, 
I, th I thought the tone earlier today, though, was too harsh myself. I, I, it's, it's a bit, you know, sort of nefarious that, you know, these guys are aiding and abetting. And so I think the situation is actually much more difficult on the ground for technology companies. I think one of the things that's interesting is that, you know, as with everything else, the pendulum is swinging hard. So, so in the previous administration, I think it's relatively fair to say these guys were left out there without a whole lot of support um, and to fend for themselves in a very hostile environment, you know, with the creation of um, the National Security Commission in China, these, you know, uh, national security law, the internet law, all of these sort of, you know, tools, very, very difficult environment. Now they're getting the opposite. You know, it's, it's sort of, you know, stop loving me, right? Um, and, and so the challenge is how do we create an environment where our companies can protect you know, their IP and uh, their sort of, you know, the things that make them valuable while still being able to have access to a, a very dynamic market. Uh, you know, this actually, I think, is the space where we're at the greatest risk of decoupling because there really aren't very good solutions um, for this because China's been completely unwilling to bend it all to give these companies some room to breathe and help them, you know, sort of protect themselves. I, I have a lot of sympathy with the critique of these companies. I mean, I, I have to yeah. say, I mean, I've spent most of my life in public service. And when I hear Google employees refusing to work for their country, I, know. Uh, I have no time for that. None at all. I mean, they want to go and make money selling bad technologies to China to repress <laughs> those people, but they won't work for us you know, to try to protect ourselves. I have no sympathy. I do think that, that we, need and, and, you know, we need to engage more with Silicon Valley and these companies, but they, they, are, they, are, they are, as long as they're here, they're Americans, and they need to step up to the plate, which is both being sensitive to the cost of their doing business in these countries. They're, to get rich is marvelous. They're all following it, but they, but they don't think about it, what it means for us. And so I, I am very, very uh, unsympathetic to their view, which is it's okay to, you know, go along with the dictates of, you know, the CCP and the, and the Standing Committee. But when, when we ask for help, yeah. they say, well, we can't dirty our hands with okay. dealing with the U.S. government. A little red meat. <laughs> <laughs> Completely agree. Yeah. Uh, would you like to have a... No, so I do, I, I think... I completely agree with Jim. I would also say we're, it'll get us to a point where we're going to have to do outbound technology screening. Yeah. And that's what companies don't want. So I think, you know, there has to be more of a dialogue uh, on these issues with corporate America, for sure. Well, join with me in thanking our panelists for an excellent discussion. I think uh, we're, we're being asked to stay. Well, while we still have you here, uh, on behalf of Will Inboden, Steve Slick, the, the Strauss Center, the Clemens Center, the Intelligence Studies Project, and UT Austin General, we love everyone who came today, but we especially love those of you who are still here <laughs> at 5.30. So give yourself a round of applause. And one last round of applause for the staff who will continue to be working hard cleaning up the aftermath of all this. We'll see you all next year for the sixth annual Texas National Security Forum. <laughs>